last couple of weeks have turned the world upside down. And I'm sure that you are aware of what's going on, what's happening in Israel. Uh, the war that has broken out there <coughs> brought humanity once again to the brink of disaster. Uh, we had so many difficult things already with the war in Ukraine, which was started by Russia, and uh, it was against Ukraine primarily, and the West backed up. Ukraine, so we, we had pretty tense situation by that time, but now when Near East got inflamed, we have, we have very difficult situation politically in the world. Uh, and this war have uh, discovered not only the evil nature of human heart, and those atrocities that we see going on in different wars, and especially in this one, uh, it's just another proof that human heart is sinful and sin is very evil. If you, if you give a freedom, if sin is not restrained, it will come to different forms of atrocities. And this is what we see, what's going on now. But uh, one more important thing happened. Uh, this war destroyed the very fine balance that the world enjoyed for the last, uh, I think, about 20 years, 15 to 20 years, balance of power in the Middle East, uh, where, where Israel was peacefully coexisting with Arab nations around uh, it. And we see that uh, everything was going fine and uh, the whole world kind of relaxed and uh, people are enjoying life because of stability, but suddenly everything just exploded. And when that balance was broken up, uh, people who live elsewhere, people who live in the United States now, they feel it. And one of the reasons why they feel it, they these events, they took away the sense of security. Suddenly, we once again feel insecure. You need to add to that several more elements which are playing an important role in all of that. One of them is that uh, this, is, uh, this is more dangerous war than it was in 1948 when Israel was just establishing itself as a nation. The reason why it's more dangerous is that Islamic world is much more spread around by that time. Last uh, several decades, uh, millions, actually millions of uh, uh, Muslim people moved from different parts of the world into the United States and especially into, uh, into Europe. And now we see uh, huge uh, demonstrations, uh, different uh, forms of protests here in the United States against Israel. The United States was historically backing up Israel and now we see that unrest here. Finally, BLM supports Palestine and Palestinian people. And you remember what happened three years ago when BLM were crushing the stores and just destroying uh, cities or downtowns in many places. So now we have all the tensions are built up and it's, it's exploded. And we don't know what will happen. Uh, well, one of the problems is that uh, the Netanyahu himself and uh, um, Israeli generals, they say that it will be very bloody war. They will have to fight in a dense, densely populated place and they will have to go deep under the city because there are a lot of those Hamas uh, operatives there. So uh, when it will start, when it's already thousands of people died on, on both sides, and when, when the world will, ground operation will start, you will see the whole world will be a mess, complete mess. So because of that, we see that people in the world and in the Christian world are suddenly feel insecure, 
suddenly feel at loss, disoriented, without knowing what's going on and how we as Christians should align ourselves, whose sides to take. What should we hope for? Where our hope should be placed? Most of the people are glued to the constant stream of news from the internet and different sources, expecting some kind of resolution. And there are different people expecting different resolutions. Some people expect that Israel would uh, uh, bring the retaliation against its enemies and triumph over it, while others think about the inevitability of thousands of civilian death, and they say, no, 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 it should be very careful, and uh, we, we kind of sympathize with Israel, but we cannot just sit still and bless that killing of thousands of tens of thousands of people. So even here at that point, people are at loss. Others, thinking farther into the future, they are expecting some kind of strategic resolution. They know that violence always begets violence. So if, if, the, if the solution will be just with violence, with the army, with might, with power, so how it will come to the coexistence uh, and they are hoping to find some kind of strategic coexistence of Israel with Arab nations. While others, and we see more and more of those, are just outright waiting for complete annihilation of Israel. So this is the world that we found ourselves two weeks ago. What should Christians do in this situation? And I am sure that if you don't ask this question yet, you will. Definitely, you will come to that position. And this is why I decided to focus on the book of Israel, today, uh, on the book of Isaiah today. I was actually planning another sermon for today, but, but I see that we need to go back to the book of Isaiah and back to the same chapter that we actually uh, were planning. To, it's our next chapter in our study in this book. <clears throat> and the reason for that is the following. You know what? Unlike those unbelievers, we who know God through Christ, we have a solid foundation with the objective truth which sheds light to every situation of the world. Anything what, will, what happened, happens and will happen is being explained in this book. This is why it is important for us to love the Bible, to know the Bible, to study the Bible, to live by the Bible, to learn how to think biblically, and to know how to live in accordance to the Bible. We need to evaluate everything that's going on through the biblical point of view. This is why we're opening the Bible and we are reading that God's truth is explaining to us not only what's going on around us, but it's explaining to us how we can get his supernatural peace within those circumstances. So today we'll focus on chapter 26 and primarily on first four verses, Isaiah chapter 26. And we read here <clears throat> the following. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah, we have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Verse 3 is a very well-known verse, and if you are a believer for some time, you most likely know this by heart. I remember in my early childhood when I memorized this verse 3, uh, which, is, uh, states, which states, you keep him in perfect place whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. But more often than not, we remember this verse without considering the context in which it was written, without understanding all the details around this verse. And in the last two weeks, another passage of Scripture had been widely, uh, widely quoted 
Again, most of those times when people quote this passage, <clears throat> they fail to understand the context and the true meaning of it. Uh, Psalm 122, verses 6 through 9, we read, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, will, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Pray for peace of Jerusalem is the, one of the key commandments of Scripture that should govern our attitude toward Jerusalem, toward, toward Israel. These days, it is often recalled and most often people use it for, in reference to end the war. And that is true. Peace of Jerusalem means ending the war, no war. But it speaks about something much greater than just absence of war. Peace, the word shalom, it's a well-known concept. It speaks about full, abundant life, about rich, secure, very plentiful life. So this is what it means. And uh, we see explanation of that <clears throat> very clearly presented in chapter 26 in the book of Isaiah. So in this chapter, we see the nature of the peace and then how to get, uh, lay hold of it, how to get this peace. And we'll take a look at these two elements <clears throat> consequently. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, Jeff, if you would give me that, uh, no, no, the, the other one. <clears throat> so there is another problem, some bug. <clears throat> it's it less of a problem than the army, but it still makes it un uncomfortable. Thank you. <clears throat> so the nature of the perfect peace, <clears throat> this is what we'll focus on. Now, as you recall, in the previous chapters, the prophet spoke of God's judgment upon the nations that surround God's people. And we were actually covering chapters from 13 to 25. And maybe when you read the book of Isaiah or book of Jeremiah or Ezekiel, maybe you were asking yourself the question, why there are so many, uh, there are so many information about different nations around Israel? These nations are not existing now. Different Moabites, uh, different Babylonians, Assyrians, and all other nations. But there is a reason why it is, uh, it is put into the uh, pages of scriptures. The reason for that is that God is explaining to us, to all people who live on earth, he's explaining that whatever would happen with Israel, and when God is punishing Israel, he will never leave any kind of evil unanswered. He will retaliate. He will punish. God's holiness and justice requires retribution for every transgression of his law. Every rebellion against his righteousness and all evil will sooner or later be punished. Isaiah then speaks about God's peace that he will establish in Israel. So after describing that punishment that he will bring upon the nations around Israel, he explains that Israel will inherit that great shalom. And there is a reason for that. The foundation of shalom of Israel is God's covenant. God established the covenant with Israel through Abraham. And then he confirmed it through David. And according to that covenant, there are some promises. And one of the key promise, promise uh, that, that the God had left uh, to the Abraham and his descendant, the key element of that promise is shalom, is blessing. They will be blessed. And because of that, God, God will bless this nation. Shalom, translated here as peace, is a state of deep, deep contentment, security, well-being, and fulfilling life with tranquility. 
This is why shalom is so much desired by many people, and especially we see it in the biblical, different biblical <clears throat> passages. In explaining the nature of this peace, Isaiah makes three clear statements. They are related to each other, and let me just demonstrate it or present them to you. The first, he said that salvation comes from the Lord, and only the Lord can ensure our safety and our security. So this is number one what we see. Look with me, verse one. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwark. Israel has been and will continue to be threatened by many various nations. This is reality of history. And there is a reason for that, why it is happening now, why it was happening for a long time, and actually for 3,000 years since this, this nation, that nation was started. And the reason for that was <clears throat> presented in the book of Deuteronomy. So go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28. You remember Israel is traveling from Egypt to the Promised Land. And before they arrived to the Promised Land, while they were camping in the plains of Moab, uh, Easter, uh, on the eastern side of uh, River Jordan. So uh, God is delivering a special message through Moses. And he explains to them, he is giving to them his law, and he is saying, I will bless you if you will keep this law. If you will keep my commandments, then according to that covenant which was established at Sinai, you will be blessed. And in chapter 28, he explains the way how they will experience this blessing. And then in verse 15 of chapter 28, he, he explains to them, but if you will not keep this covenant, if you will not be faithful to the commandments that I am giving to you, then you will experience these curses. And among those curses, listen what he is uh, speaking about. Verse 47. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, because of the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like the eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young. It shall eat the offspring of your cattle and the fruit of, uh, of your ground until you are destroyed. It also shall not leave you grain, wine, or oil, the increase of your herd or, or the young of your flock until they have caused you to perish. They shall besiege you in all your towns until you, your high and fortified walls in which you, are, you trusted came down through, throughout all your land. And they shall besiege you in all your towns throughout all... Uh, your land which the Lord God, your God has given you. And then a few verses below, verse 46, uh, 64, and the Lord will scatter you among all people from one end to the, of the earth to another. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone which neither you nor your father have known. And among those, these nations you shall find no respite. And there shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot, but the Lord will give you there a trembling heart and failing eyes and a languishing soul. This is a very interesting and very important passage of Scripture. Look, God has elected, has chosen the nation of Israel. And he established a covenant with them. There was first covenant 
called Abrahamic covenant, which was established with the, uh, Abraham, the father of Israel nation. Then the second covenant, Sinaitic covenant, where God presented them the law and all the commandments. And they promised, actually, you remember uh, Exodus chapter 24? There they came upon that mountain and they said, everything that you command to us, we will obey. They promised. And he specifically warned them, if you read Deuteronomy chapter 8, he's saying when you will come to that earth, when you will get the abundance of the produce that you will have, and you will have those houses you did not build, and you will enjoy the blessings of that life, do not forget. Don't forget, Lord, your God. But that's exactly what happened. And he warned them, if that will happen, this is what will be going on with you. And since that time, we see how Israel was departing from the Lord, how Israel was unfaithful, how they were turning to idols, how they were disregarding God, how unthankful they were toward God. And God has warned them more and more. He was sending prophets to them. And prophets were preaching, trying to turn their attention back to the Lord. And some of them were successful. We see some regeneration or some signs of renewed interest toward God. And we see that some kings were more successful in that. But pretty soon, king, the good king dies and everything goes back to the same way. And finally, that happened. Israel was scattered around the nation. And this is still going on. You know, one of the interesting things, distinctives of Israel as a nation, is that there was no other nation which had been as blessed as Israel. Just take a look at the list of the most successful people in the, in the history, actually, not just today in history in arts, in technologies, and uh, just look, Nobel Prize winners. And you will see disproportionately big list of Jewish names there. So it speaks about very talented people, very gifted people. But at the same time, there is no nation in the world which had experienced that level of aggression, hostility, and outright desire to annihilate it. This is what we see. This is this is very interesting thing that we see in history. Actually, there was there were many rulers who had set their specific goal to destroy every single Jew. You remember the book of Esther in the Bible? You remember that story? The Haman who tried to uh, to rally and he actually got the law from the king, guaranteeing that every, every Jew, you see, what's interesting, he had a problem with Mordecai, but he decided that every Jew has to be eliminated. And he was not alone. Uh, we read the history of Antioch Epiphan. Exactly the same thing, which he, what he is, it was the um, Greek, Greek ruler over the Palestine, and he had the desire to exterminate all the all Jews. And then we, we read about different Roman emperors which were persecuting uh, Jews very harshly. And then pogroms, if you read about that in history. And that happened not only in Russia. You know, 19th century Russia, famous pogroms against Jews. It, it actually happened all around the world. They were targeting Jews specifically. And then Hitler. Uh, you can imagine one of the most powerful rulers at the time of the, uh, of the earth. He rallies the whole country around single idea to destroy specifically every single Jew. This is a very mysterious nation. <laughs> when you read all those nations, the list of the nations in the Bible, Amorites, Ammonites, Moabites, and where they are. Uh, they're, they're just not existing. 
they ended up somewhere there in history. But there was not a nation which had been experiencing so much hostility toward, but still alive. They still live. They did not have their country, their place for 1900 years, 19 centuries. And now, like that, 1948, they're back together. They exist as a nation. So this is why we see that the reason for what is happening is built in the foundation of God's promises. God said that when he had chosen Abraham. He said that, I will bless you. And then through Moses, he said, I will punish you. I will scatter you around. And then he said, I will gather you back together. You know, when I look at that, I see it's, it's one of the most powerful testimonies about the truthfulness and validity of the Word of God. You cannot go around it. And you can be sure if the Word of God is saying something, that will happen. That will happen in your life in the same way as it happening in the life of Israel for 3,000 years. This is very clear explanation. So when, when we see all of those difficulties that Israel is experiencing, so now go back to Isaiah 26, verses 1 through 4. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls, walls and bulwarks. Despite constant attempts to destroy Israel, no one has succeeded. And the reason for that, just one, he sets up salvation. Not military power, not alliances, not America, not smart Jews. No. There's only one source. There's only one reason why Israel still exists. Because God has something to do with it. Because God gives salvation. Through the book of Isaiah, we see it, how it, it happens. You remember then when we were studying chapter 7, two nations up north, Samaria and Syria, were trying to destroy or planning, they were gathering their armies to destroy Judah. And you remember uh, that chapter of, uh, starts with uh, Ahaz, the uh, king of Judah, uh, going around the city and trying to evaluate walls and uh, that uh, water, water lines uh, supplying the water to the city. And God is sending Isaiah to explain to that king, don't worry, relax. I will not allow Jerusalem to fall. And you remember that Ahaz does not believe. Why he does not believe? Just because he used to measure his success through physical strength. And he does not see how it could be added up, the strength of that army and his ability to stand against it. He is much weaker than that army is actually threatened, the power of that army that threatened them. And when he sees that, you remember that Isaiah is saying, just ask God for a sign. And God would give you a sign that your, your faith would be strengthened. And Ahaz re refused to do that. And then Isaiah recorded that famous prophecy. You remember Isaiah 7, chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then verse 16. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings are you dread will be deserted. You remember what, what happened? Ahaz was sure that he does not have enough strength to withstand that powerful push from the north. And he, he actually did not believe that God would intervene. But what happened? Actually, 
those plans never materialized because Assyria, which is northeast from that place, they actually started to push against Samaria and Syria and they had their hands full. They, they were not uh, in, in a good place to think about Judea. So God providentially saved Jerusalem at that time. And this is what we see throughout the history. Then in chapter 9, Isaiah again speaks of God's salvation. And again, this salvation comes from God, not, not from army. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Look, Isaiah did not say, for unto us an army is given. He is saying, for unto us a child is born. God saves, Jehovah saves, not our might. And then in chapter 25, verse 9, we come to the the same conclusion once again. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. He might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. And let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is why in the next chapter, verse 1, And that day this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have strong city. He sets up. Salvation. So this is the first truth in this text. And it explains to us that uh, <clears throat> God's perfect peace starts with security. And God is our security. Not a political system. Not an army. Not those alliances, NATO or something else. The only one reason why we can have hope. Because God saves. God is the source of of security. Psalmist writes in Psalm 62, verse 1, For God alone my soul waits in silence, for from Him comes my salvation. My security comes from Him. And this is the first part of the perfect peace. Second part, shalom come, will come from the Lord. The second aspect of that is related to the uh, abundant life. So if the first part is this, God is a source of security, of salvation, but the second aspect, God is a source of completeness, of our abundant life, uh, fullness of life. Actually, speaking of this, Isaiah re repeats the word shalom twice. So when we read this uh, in verse 3, you keep him in perfect peace. This word, uh, this phrase, perfect peace, actually in the original is shalom, shalom. So if shalom is fullness of life, fullness of blessing, so when he speaks shalom, shalom, he is saying fullness of fullness of life. So and this is a very, very good translation, actually, in perfect peace. You keep him in perfect peace. Perfect uh, peace is... Uh, inextricably linked to God's trustworthiness and steadfastness. Look the verse uh, 4. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. It's a very interesting thing. Today we are witnessing actually a tectonic shift in the world. Since in the end of the World War II, there was some kind of satellite balance of power, West and Soviet Union, and then after Soviet Union fell apart in the early 1990s, there was a time of uncertainty and struggle, and now those powers are on the move. Now we see China aligning with Russia, and they are backing off the Palestinians, uh, and the reason for that is not that they are pro-Muslims. No, no. The reason for that is they want to undermine the American dominance. 
So and now we see that they, are, they got pretty powerful and they understand that situation here in the West with all of those Muslims living here, it weakened the West in a big way. So they're hoping to redraw the map of the world. So all of those nations are on the move. And, and when we are thinking about stability, this is a very important verse to understand. Read once again verse 4. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock. NATO is not. And China is not. And all other countries is not. You know, we lived through the fall of Soviet Union. We lived inside. And I don't know what you thought about Soviet Union when you were here and Soviet Union was at its height, but we never thought that it would, it would ever fall apart. With all those nuclear arms and everything, and everything was under just strictest control possible. It is impossible, human thinking. It is impossible. But we know that we cannot trust in any human power. Not in America, not in NATO, not in China, not in anything. Because for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Actually, the Lord God is a very interesting word here. <clears throat> uh, when we are speaking about that, um, it's actually... Two words, same, same words, just one first one is short and second one is full. Uh, here we see the Lord God, two different words. Uh, it would be in Hebrew, Yahweh Elohim, but it's actually Yahweh Yahweh, Jehovah Jehovah. And the reason why it's put here in this way is that it's, he's underlining that only him, he himself is a solid rock. No one else. In spite of everything that happens around us, God continues to be the foundation of the universe. He is in control of everything. He has a plan that leads to the greatest good for his children. And this plan is good, acceptable, and perfect. And this is why we can have peace and stability in our hearts. That's how David put it. You know, David experienced a lot of hostility and a lot of uncertainty in his life. You remember that years of persecution from Saul, and then after that, struggle with the Philistines, and then the rebellion of his own son, Absalom. And through that, David learned one lesson well. The security and peace of heart, prosperity and confidence can only come from God. Psalm 62, verse 6. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in Him at all times. O oh, people, pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. The New Testament says the same thing. The Apostle Paul, speaking how to overcome anxiety and fear, explains Philippians 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Look what's here. Peace of God is something that cannot be calculated or rationally explained. It actually exceeds, surpasses all understanding. This is what comes from God. This is something that He does. He carries our soul into that deep state of peace, confidence, and contented, contentment in, in Him. Contentment in Him. Because of His strength, and his stability and his guarantees that he gives to his own. Only he can bring our life into that state. Only he can keep us in that conditions. Look once again, you keep him in perfect peace. And then we come to the last point here, trust in the Lord. The salvation will come from the Lord. 
so security. Then shalom will come from the Lord, so the fullness of life comes from the Lord. And because of that, he is speaking to us. He, he was speaking to people then, and he's speaking to us now. Trust in the Lord. The trusting the Lord is the gateway to shalom. That's the entry point. So now when we live in this very unstable world, the world on fire, when we find ourselves, ourselves in this very difficult situation, we have very clear determination, very clear, clear direction from the Lord. Trust in the Lord. He speaks about it in several ways. First of all, in verse 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. This is a very good translation, which helps us to understand. Uh, actually, it's it different from the Russian translation. In Russian, it says, "Твердого духом ты хранишь в совершенном мире." Твердого духом is can be translated as, as "steadfast of mind," and actually, NASB translates in the same way: "Steadfast in mind, you will keep in perfect peace." But I believe that ESV explains it a little bit better. It, it makes uh, sure that the strength is not in us. This is not a human with an iron will or fearless heart. This is certain people who have steadfast mind or steadfast heart, and because of that, they will endure the perfect peace. No. The, the source of peace is Him, is God. And this is very clearly stated here. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. This is all that we need. God has that peace. And all what we need if you are his covenant people, he's part of his covenant, which we are through Jesus Christ. We can count on him. We are his own. We belong to him, and he will not let us down. He will protect us, he will take care of us, and we can lay our trust on him. But the only thing which we need, our mind should stay in him. And that's the most difficult thing, especially nowadays. You know that the most fierce battle, spiritual battle, happens around your attention. This Satan puts all his strength, all his power, and the most aggressive attacks are not in somewhere demonic, you know, uh, kind of uh, satanic rituals. No, 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 no. Those are clear. People know what's going on there. The most aggressive attack comes when your mind is not alert. He's fighting for your attention. All that he needs to do, take off your mind from him, from the Lord, and you will guarantee lose peace. You will not have peace. You will not have, you will lose sense of security. You will, you will lose sense of firmness. And you will definitely lose satisfaction. And this is what we see in the world today. This is what we see in the Christian world today. This is where Christians are losing their battles day in, day out. I will give you several reasons for our inability to focus on God. The reason number one is poor knowledge of God's word. This is the reason number one. This is what happens. Poor knowledge of the Word of God. You know that we can focus our mind on God only through Scripture. Uh, this is not the, how Eastern religious teach that you just sit down and you just empty your mind and you are just meditate somehow and, <clears throat> and you're focusing on God, on, on some kind of divine power. No. The only way to focus your mind on God is to know the Word of God which, speak, which speaks about God which reveals God to you, 
which informs about God, which gives you God's mind, which provides you with His ways. So in order to focus on God, you need at least to know the Word of God which speaks about God. Now try to think how much the Word of God you intake daily or weekly. If you don't know about God, you cannot stay, you cannot focus your mind on Him. For simple reason, you just don't have something to put your mind on. You just don't. And you can be convinced that you are a good believer, yet you truly want to read the Bible. You truly want to focus on God, but you're just too busy. Last couple of weeks, I had several meetings with different people from those who are in some kind of leadership to those who are just maybe got interested in the Bible, in in the Christianity. And you know what I hear from all of them? Yeah, this is good. Yeah, yeah, I do I do need to get to the Bible. But I'm just too busy. Look, look, and they're showing me their schedule. Look, I'm here, there, here, there, there. I, and I had to be there. You know what I tell them? You don't you don't need to explain it to me. You just need to you just need to know if there is no intake from the word of God. You don't know God, and because of that, you will never be satisfied. So you go and decide what you have to give up in order to clear your schedule and to get your mind on Scripture. This is you decide. I cannot make you to do that. But you need to know that if you don't know the Word of God, you just cannot trust Him. It's simple. You can trust only that word that you know and remember at a certain point of your life. So this is number one problem. Problem number two, laziness. And we live today in a very lazy world. I mean lazy in mind. You know, if prior to that people had to read another witch. So that's the next level. In order to To read, you need to exercise your mind more. And now they're not only watching. You know what? They're watching bits. Just bits and pieces. Uh, Last week I read another article which speaks about human attention. And I used to think, the, the previous research I read maybe 10 years ago, that human attention is good just for three minutes. Two, three minutes. You know where it is now? 47 seconds. So every 47 seconds, and it's scientifically proven, every 47 seconds, human mind needs to switch to something. Like from Facebook to Instagram, from Instagram to Telegram, from Telegram to uh, TikTok, from TikTok to maybe to do some work. And it's not for long, then TikTok is calling, then Instagram is trying to get your attention. That's all. You know what? To think about God requires an effort, a serious effort of your mind. And this is why we see it in Scripture. Number three, the, a multitude of distractions. And we see so many different things that we are distracted with. Numerous social networks, notifications, messages, calls, politics, sports, work, friends, the usual stuff in life, just everything that comes out. All of that occupies our attention. We simply don't have time to think about God. We are just distracted for so many things. And as a result, we are filled with anxiety, fears, and every growing dissatisfaction instead of being filled with, the God, with God's peace. Then fear and anxiety. 
When faced with multiple threats, uh, real or perceived, we tend to think about them instead of thinking of, about God. Peter walking on water at Christ's invitation, he began to look at the raging waves and began to think that that's reality. Or remember Jeremiah, the book of Lamentation. He was witnessing the destruction of Jerusalem and it was so painful that that pain just, just took grip on his heart. And, and he is saying, actually, if you remember, that he is saying at that time, my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down. And then he replies to his soul. He is saying to, to himself that he needs to get his, at his attention from his grief to God and his mercy. So this is what happens in reality. And the last one, strong desires. When we're talking about strong desires, there are many different things. <clears throat> we can desire anything from the most innocent things to obviously sinful. This can be a girl or a guy that you like or upcoming vacation or trip video game or sport competition, new car, good job, a house, or, or something. Something that you just desire it, and it occupies you. It takes your attention. You know what? The devil does not care what your feelings and thoughts are drawn to. As long as they are not focused on God, this is guaranteed to deprive you of peace. And, and we need to remember that. That's the greatest fight that happens, spiritual fight that happens now in our life. Concentration of consciousness on the Lord makes it possible for the second element, which is trust in Him. <clears throat> we can read the last portion of verse 3. Whose mind, you keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because He trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. God keeps his children in perfect peace because they trust in him, knowing his power, knowing his love, knowing his faithfulness to his people. They trust him with their lives, their future, their destiny. Therefore, they have complete peace even in the midst of the raging sea of sorrows. And a good example of this is the prophet Daniel. You remember when he was in the lion's den, when, uh, where he, he found himself because of the animosity of his enemies. Specific plan was designed to put him there. So everything was going against him, but Daniel is not afraid. Why? He knows God. He actually prayed to God. And you remember why he got there in lion's den? Because he was faithfully praying to God. And not just praying, just really quick, in between Instagram and Facebook. No, no, he was going back home, opening his windows toward Jerusalem, even it was prohibited in time when it was against the law. He was continuing to do that set aside specific time to being alone with God. That's the explanation why he does not have fear in the lion's den. That's the only explanation, because he exercised his trust. He was reinforcing his view of God over and over again. He knew God's word. He prayed to God regularly. This is why he can trust the Lord. This is how it explains. Trust in the Lord forever, and I already... Uh, I mentioned that, but uh, let's look again to this word. The Lord God, uh, Yah Yahweh, an uh, everlasting rock. Trust in the uh, Legacy Standard Bible uh, gives it in this, in this way. Trust in, the, in Yahweh forever, for in Yah Yahweh himself we have an everlasting rock. So the Lord and only he himself is the eternal stronghold so we can and should trust in him and <clears throat> trust him. So the nature of perfect peace 
is inseparably linked to God. Perfect peace is in Him. He is the source of security, and He is the source of complete, abundant life. And knowing Him, concentrating on Him, and trusting in Him is the practical way, gateway, how to attain this peace. And now let's have just a little bit of time for the second portion, obtaining perfect peace. What is the process? To whom God is speaking? To whom He is promising this peace? And we see a couple of things which are important for us. First of all, perfect peace is connected to the Messiah. It's not just God is giving broad promise to everyone on earth. No, in the book of Isaiah, we see it very clearly that it's related to a certain day and certain action of the Messiah. Look once again, verse 1. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. In that day, he speaks about a certain day. And then we, see, we found this phrase often in the book of Isaiah, as well as in many other prophetic books. Uh, more often than not, it points to the coming of the Messiah, to the establishment of his kingdom. Here's how it's used a few verses about. Look, uh, chapter 25, verse 8. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day. Again, we see the mention of that day. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Obviously, he is talking here about salvation accomplished by Christ because we see he will swallow up death forever. It's clear, clear reference to Jesus Christ. So he is speaking about Israel's time of returning back to the Lord and putting their trust in him. And we have said many times that this will happen uh, right before the millennium, before the second coming of Christ. God promised this actually to Israel in the book of Deuteronomy. We already read from chapter 28, and now let us read just several verses from chapter 30. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, and he speaks, remember, prior to Israelites entering the promised land. He is speaking, and when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. So God had predicted that this will happen. One day Israel will be regathered, but that will happen at the time of their repentance. Isaiah actually speaks about that, and we already mentioned a couple of those passages. If you would turn Isaiah chapter 4, look what he is saying here. In that day... Again, the same reference. Chapter 4, verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem, Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning. 
So he is saying about the time when that branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. Then in chapter 11, we read about the same, the prof, next step of that same prophecy. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and the branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the Lord, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ear hear. But the right, with righteousness he, will, he j- shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek on the, of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. We were studying that passage and we were explaining that it speaks about millennium definitely. It does not speak about the eternal state because there there are poor. Uh, there will not be poor in the eternal state, in the heavenly Jerusalem. But what we see here that uh, the Messiah shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of, the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Clearly he speaks about Antichrist. So what we see here that God is actually promising to Israel there will be time when peace will be restored for you, when that shalom will be part of your life. You, Jerusalem, you, Israel, will enjoy that. This is what it means, Isaiah 26, 1. In that day, in that day when millennium will be established, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. This is why it's related not just to a spiritual condition of people, but to a physical restoration of Israel. So Israel will have perfect peace during the reign of Messiah when he, with the breath of his lips, shall kill the wicked. He will completely remove all threats to Israel and establish a kingdom of righteousness and peace. But there is a second part in that. Perfect peace is associated with righteousness. Look, verse 2. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. So it's not just establishing the millennium kingdom of Messiah. No, it's changing the nation. It's transforming their all, all the inner, inner being, their hearts. And this is exactly what we see was predicted in Deuteronomy. Go back to Deuteronomy 30, verses 6 through 8. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. So he speaks about the nation of Israel. And he he clearly states, and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your voice and enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. All these things will one day come to pass with the people of Israel. All these things will be possible because of the Messiah who died for us at the cross of Calvary, who conquered sin and made us righteous in him. What will happen to Israel as a nation in the future is already actually happening to every believer in Jesus Christ, to every person who is redeemed by Christ. And today each of us can have perfect peace despite of what's going on in the world around us. It can only be obtained through the Messiah. Only he can reconcile us to God. Actually, the trusting Christ relates us, connects us with God, and connects with His peace. This is why it is so important today when the world is aflame. So important to know the Lord. So important to trust the Lord. And I would like to ask you, my friend, if you know Christ, 
if you have committed your heart, your life to Christ. Because this Christ is the only way to get in covenant relationship with God. To be part of His promises. To be part of His faithfulness. We can find refuge in God through Christ Jesus alone. Christ promised us actually in John 14, 27, peace I live with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be, be troubled, neither let them be afraid. In conclusion, I would like to say a few words about how does this help us to have the right attitude toward what is happening in Israel and in the world today. <clears throat> Just summing up, number one, what happens in Israel is in accordance with the word of God. And we demonstrated it. God said that, that Israel will always be in trouble because of their unbelief, their unfaithfulness. But at the same time, he said that God will surely save Israel. It's very clear. Israel will not go out of existence. No, Israel will continue on up until the point where God will save the whole Israel. Yeah, people around, nations around will fight and all that disturbance will happen. And we will never be able to figure out who is doing what there. But we know for sure that Israel will remain. God will save Israel. Then we need to pray for Israel. Why we pray for Israel? Because Israel is dear to God. And even when God allows that to happen to Israel, God is doing that for the purpose of purging, cleaning, showing his eternal purpose for, for his nation, demonstrating that he has a plan then the next one, we need to bless Israel. How we bless Israel? Praying for it. Praying for God's shalom come upon them. Praying for God's salvation. Praying for God's protection. This is what the Bible calls us to do. And the last one, we need to remember that the hope of the whole world is in Christ Jesus alone. Because every, all hope of Israel is in the Messiah. And we know that Messiah. And he became our Messiah. And he became our Christ through whom we can trust God and we can find that complete shalom in him. Psalm 122, before we <clears throat> pray, once again, verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. We'll now have time for prayer and let us kneel down and Spend some time just in silent prayer, praying about Jerusalem, praying to God about ourselves in these circumstances. Our Lord God, we thank you for your grace, your completely deserved love that you <clears throat> expressed to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us at the cross, making us your sons and daughters, establishing a covenant, new covenant that we are part of. 
Thank you, the Lord, Lord, that you are giving us that grace that in this troubled world we can come to you and we can rely on you. We can place our hope upon you and we can be assured that you are the stronghold. You are the immovable foundation of everything that exists and you are in control of everything. Lord, and I ask you for every one of us that you would give us this grace to focus our mind on you, that we would find peace in you, that we would find security and confidence, that we would see hope in you, that we would trust in you. Lord, you know everyone who is here. Lord, we, we do need this strength from you. And Lord, our prayers about Jerusalem and Israel today stop this war we know Lord that you can do that we know that you have some plans we, we know that we can trust you but at the same time looking for death of many many lives Lord we ask your protection especially for your children for those who are uh, who belong to you who are saved by Christ now our brothers and sisters living in that region and even in the Ukraine now when another war is raging. We ask your protection, we ask your strength and definitely, Lord, we ask for your shalom in every heart. Lord, help us living in this difficult world to be carriers, conduits of your grace and your peace for the people around us. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen.